everyone, and welcome to the Impact Co. podcast. That's right, we have changed our name, formerly Impactful Conversations, and we're very excited to bring you the new rebranded Impactful Conversations podcast to you today. Uh, Impact Co. is a name that we put together um, over the last few months. We've been working hard at it with our team, and it's something you know that represents our core purpose, which is to educate and to inspire. And we're very excited today, even though it is episode 37, it is also the first episode of the Impact Co. podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined by Tim Mitchell. Uh, Tim is the Head of Digital Transformation at Flux Labs. He is also a male and guardian top 200 young South Africans uh, from 2020, particularly in science and technology. He is a rock star, and I'm sure you will get to know uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, Tim, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Um, how are you doing this cloudy morning? Hey, it's a Fadza. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the podcast and a very good day to all of your listeners. Uh, doing great on my side. Thanks. Uh, enjoying the, the cloudy, cool weather and the occasional little bit of thunder. But uh, yeah, looking forward to our chat. Oh, awesome. Awesome, Tim. So, Tim, you know, diving right into it, I think, you know, we want to get to know you a little bit better. Um, yeah, so tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, in terms of where you were born and where you grew up? Yeah, for sure. So, fairly simple backstory on my side. I'm Joburg born and bred. Um, grew up in my little Bryanston bubble. Lived most of my life here. Uh, went over to Cape Town straight after high school to do my studies there at UCT. I studied a, a business science. Um, I managed to find a, a girlfriend there, now fiance. Uh, convinced her to come back to Joburg and we've been living and working here for the last uh, roughly eight years or so and we're actually one month away from from getting married so big milestone coming up for us and yeah really love South Africa it's, it's been a great place to grow up and live and work and play. Yeah congratulations on that and uh, well firstly congratulations on convincing her to move to Joburg. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hard part. <laughs> That's a hard part, yeah. Um, I've also, you know, uh, you know, grew up in Germany as well, as, as you know. I think it's been, you know, it's been, it's it's quite a shift to go to Cape Town, um, you know, from the Joburg lifestyle, the sort of fast paced to sort of Cape Town lifestyle. So I, I know exactly what you went through. So tell me, you know, currently you obviously are, you know, in, you know, in in your job currently in Joburg at the moment. What's a typical day in your life currently? Um, and I guess, you know, I would like to juxtapose that with, you know, pre a previous time to you, anybody who sort of stalks you on LinkedIn or, you know, Googles, you will know your your sort of corporate history as well. I'd like to juxtapose that with what it was like in corporate, whereas what is it like now currently? Yeah, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, it, it's been really exciting starting a, a new gig and being part of a small team. Um, and with that comes, you know, a lot of flexibility. So what I like to do, my, my sort of day-to-day -day ritual, I, I get up, I try to go for a 5K run most mornings. Uh, if I don't get that in, I, I try to do some kind of exercise during the day, whether it be soccer or tennis or something else. Um, I often, the way I consume a lot of my news and content is through uh, audio books and through podcasts. So often put the podcast in, go for a run, listen to something like The Money Show with Bruce Whitfield or uh, the Prof G podcast with Scott Galloway is always a highlight. And uh, yeah, from there, I, I kind of, you know, get myself ready for the day and clear the mailbox. I like to do that before the, the working world sort of wakes up, uh, get through through any of those mails and sort out my to-do list. And then uh, typically a couple of meetings, you know, check in with the, the sort of leadership team, see what our, our latest priorities are, any updates, uh, followed by usually team stand-ups. So, I'm on a couple of project teams and it's important just to make sure that everyone's clear on their agenda uh, for the day ahead and that there aren't any critical blockers. And then depending on how the day goes, maybe I've got some client activities, a workshop or uh, a steer co or something like that will typically be the focus. Uh, but if it's more of a clear day, then I love to try and block out time and I, I'm really deliberate about it. I try to, you know, quite literally put chunks in my diary where people cannot contact me. Uh, and turn that into good slots for deep work. Uh, and I find there's a big difference between deep work and shallow work. And I'm quite glad 
especially now in a more flexible environment that I can choose when those slots are. Um, and I think, you know, to be honest, that's the big difference between where I am now versus a, a corporate world is that flexibility. So, you know, my mailbox is looking a whole lot emptier. My, my calendar is looking a lot more flexible. Um, even my dress code, I can wear whatever I want. And um, yeah, it just gives me control of my day, which, which I really appreciate. And I find I, I'm a lot more productive, get a lot of deep work done and get to engage with the right people at the right moments. Uh, so yeah, that, that's typically how I spend my day. Uh, but after that, I like to wind down, watch some Netflix or you know, try to have a, a good sort of time with, with the fiance. Dinner time is always important. So she's quite a great cook and we, we spend our evenings together and occasionally I have to get back behind the screen a little bit later. Uh, but uh, as long as I carve out that personal time and I have that flexibility, then I'm a happy man. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a couple of things, you know, strike, strike out is around, you know, your discipline in, in terms of your time, um, you know, around deep work. I think that's quite a quite an important thing to, to carve out and make sure that mm. you do for that. And you are right. There's a big difference between deep work and shallow work and, and yeah. allowing time to focus I think is incredibly important and so thanks for, for sharing that I'm sure there's a couple of, of nuggets of gold in there for anybody who is listening sure. um diving into you know I want us to talk about you know driving disruption through through digital transformation mm -hmm. so at the offset you know some of the listeners who are listening to this are like what on earth is digital transformation <laughs> like what is that um let's talk basics right what what does it actually entail? What does digital transformation actually entail in your mind? Yeah, for sure. So it's um, it's one of these terms that's thrown around every single boardroom. And, you know, we, we see it online on LinkedIn. We see it in blogs. We see it on uh, reports and articles. And I think I, I've been quite um, you know specific when I try to bed down a definition of what digital transformation is to share with my clients and with my colleagues, just to distill it down to its most simple form. Uh, and I like to say digital transformation is basically the unlock of dormant value. Uh, so value that otherwise would not have been uh, found mm -hmm. through strategic thinking um, and through a means that modernizes a business. Um, and the way in which you modernize that business is through exponential technology. And there's a reason why I put the technology right at the end of that definition, uh, because a lot of people jump to the technology first and they say, well, digital transformation must be blockchain or AI or cloud. Yeah. And of course, you know, those things can enable a digital transformation. But to me, it's you, you have to keep the conversation at a far more strategic level. Um, yeah. And as soon as you do that, you find that you can unlock that digital value. And I think a, a quick uh, shout out to to one of my mentors who also helped to you know, describe this and decipher it in such a clear way, uh, a man by the name of Walter Adeo. Um, and he's uh, a chief digital officer, spends a lot of his time with some of South Africa's leading, uh, leading clients gu guiding their digital transformation. And he pins it down to three digital dividends, three ways in which you can create value through digital transformation. And it's three letters, the G, the P, and the X. So the G is for growth. Uh, that's revenue uplift, the creation of new sources of value. The P is productivity. So that's unlocking efficiency or finding optimization in your current business. And then the X is all about experience. Uh, and that's enhancing the engagement with both your customer and your employee. So if you focus your digital transformation efforts on any combination of those three digital dividends, then that's exactly how you unlock value through digital transformation. It's an amazing definition. <laughs> it's an amazing definition. Um, and I think you're quite right. I, I love I love how you talk about dormant value, right? It, it's, yeah. it's inherently there. We just need to unlock it. I think that's why it's it's absolutely so important. And so, Tim, sometimes when the word disruption is, is mentioned, um, it can be taken in a negative context. But we're talking about positive disruption here, right? And and mm. I want to get your take on, you know, how how is this type of disruption so impactful to to organizations in your view? So so the reason I love the term disruption and why it excites me, sure, it's you know, it's a word that a lot of people throw around, but mm. it, it's really exciting because there's no better way to shake up an industry and to create opportunity than through disruption. 
Um, you know, typically we, we see sectors and industries where organizations have done things the same way repeatedly uh, throughout history. And sure, they've created, you know, incremental value over the years, but they really haven't shifted the way fundamentally that they do things. And what I like about digital transformation is the ability for it to help, you know, the underdog or the new player at the table. Yeah. Um, or even even an old player that's uh, refreshed themselves and thought differently about their business model and how they can innovate uh, to have a seat at the table. And it's through that disruption that, you know, we're able to unlock new value through, uh, you know, the creation of new sectors and subsectors, seeing uh, almost a conversion of sectors in some cases, uh, creating new competition, uh, new jobs, new skills. Um, and most importantly, I suppose, new quantums of value that, that were never before seen. And I think a, a quick example that I often like to share, um, there, there's a stat that, that goes around and it's one of these really cool uh, YouTube videos that shows the world's top 10 largest companies by market cap and sort of tracks it over the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, if you compare it today versus 20 years ago, uh, where we used to see the oil giants, the retail giants, uh, perhaps automotive banking, there's been a massive shift where now eight out of 10 of the world's largest companies today are digital businesses. Um, and you know, if, if we take a look at the largest one in the world right now, Apple, they're sitting at number one. It took 42 years for Apple to reach a trillion dollar valuation back in 2018. After that, it took them only two years to reach their two trillion mark. And after that, most recently, they hit the three trillion mark in just 16 months. Um, so that pace of change, truly exponential. And I think the reason it excites me is because many of the levers that they're using are based on digital transformation and digital business. Yeah. So we're seeing a shift where their fastest growing sources of revenue um, are actually uh, sort of services, services businesses, things like the App Store, iCloud, Apple Music, Apple Pay. Um, and they're a great example of a disruptive player because they're starting to now challenge players in other sectors completely. They're a financial services player, they're a healthcare player, media, technology, even gaming. Uh, and to me, that's what excites me about digital transformation is that you know these businesses can be shapeshifters uh, and they can enter and dominate new sectors just by thinking differently and adopting technology in a really, really smart way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the example that you make there is is, is a really good one. I think uh, Apple Apple has truly, you know, changed the way that you know we we interact with each other. We we consume content. Um, you know, the way we we value certain things as well. And yeah. I think that the point that you make is is a really good one around the exponential growth. It truly is, you know, remarkable exponential growth. Um, and, and a sign of that sort of positive disruption as well. So, you know, talking about that, um, where do you think organizations go wrong or usually go wrong with their digital transformation initiatives? I think you've mentioned one, which is, you know, we sort of jump straight to the technology. Um, you know, but where, where else do you think we, we typically go wrong, you know, with different organizations across the board? So I think the main thing for me is, Organizations who like the idea of digital transformation, but they don't have a North Star or a golden thread at all in their digital transformation strategy. Yeah. And what typically ends up happening, and it's a term I really love to use, is that they end up committing random acts of digital where, you know, sure, they're engaging with digital and they, you know, maybe they hire an analyst who, who does a little bit of research and, you know, tracks the trends and tries to figure out what the future of their industry might look like produces a little spreadsheet once a month and the exco maybe glances over it at best, but there's no real impact. There's no real, uh, you know, golden thread in that organization that helps to define what is the goal that we're setting for ourselves, not in two years, not in three years, but we're talking in sort of a five to 10 year tranche. Yeah. And that's where digital transformation really gets exciting and where it gets, gets real, where it gets impactful. Those organizations that set a clear ambition and I always say to, to the clients that I work with, you have to be really deliberate about setting that North Star ambition. So that guiding light, where is it that you want to go in five to 10 years time? And I spend a lot of time with them setting that future state. So we talk about the creation of this future state. Um, and, and I tell them to, 
to really think sky's the limit, you know, beyond borders, beyond their business of today, what is it that they would like to achieve? So we set that ambition and then we work backwards. We, we do an assessment of their current states and we say, look, here's where you are today. Let's get real. Let's understand what your, your current parameters are. And then we work together to say, all right, so in order to do this gap analysis between future state and current state, clearly we need a roadmap. We need some kind of transition to get you from A to B. And that's where we spend a lot of our time. We build those roadmaps with our clients. Uh, we define what it is they need to achieve. Um, and then we help to execute on that roadmap to get from current state through to future state. Uh, and that's how we, we create that digital transformation journey. Yeah, and I love the phrase, you know, the, the North Star, <laughs> random acts of digital. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to do so much of it. <laughs> yeah, no, you have to move away from random acts of digital and, and towards a sort of executed strategy that, that really does make sense and drives, you know, the positive growth that, that every company and every organization wants to achieve. Yeah. And I guess, you know, swinging to another sort of type of business, if we talk sort of, uh, you know, startups, um, what, what types of skills, what kinds of skills should entrepreneurs currently uh, be mm. skilling themselves in? Uh, in your mind at the moment in the current landscape? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I spend a lot of time with startups uh, and for two reasons. We, we help to accelerate startups as part of Flux Labs, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, with some of the corporate work that I do, startups become our delivery arm. So, you know, I, I'm a strategist. I, I'm more of a thinker than a doer, uh, but I like to work alongside some of, you know, South Africa's smartest um, developers, designers, uh, guys who really understand the technology in a variety of different fields. And a few things that I've picked up, um, you know, some key skills that I think are, are going to separate the winners from the losers in this entrepreneurial space. Um, maybe two key ones that I can reflect on. The one is to embrace this concept of, you know, the power of a polymath. Um, of course, you know, some people need to be specialists in their domain. But I find that, you know, some of the best entrepreneurial business leaders that I've ever met uh, are the ones who realize that connecting the dots can sometimes be more powerful than generating the dots themselves. Um, and it's, you know, that concept really speaks to trying to understand many different disciplines beyond your domain of expertise uh, and striking a balance between sort of learning to embrace it um, and finding the best talent to execute on it. Um, so, you know, even if you're not an expert, let's say in finance or accounting, you need to at least be able to interrogate and understand the, the basics behind your, your financial plan and sure, then get someone to execute on it. Uh, similar with any technology domain as well. Um, and always, there's one sort of, one of my greatest uh, sort of polymaths of all time, someone I always look up to, uh, the good old Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and we all know him as, you know, he was an artist, he was a mathematician, an engineer, a scientist, architect, uh, even astronomer. Um, but th there's one great story about him, and there's actually a, a great documentary by Vox, where he was a military engineer, and he was hired to build essentially the world's first ever satellite map back in the 15, um, yeah, 1502 era, before satellites even existed. And the way that he did it was by bringing together multiple disciplines. So because he was a strong artist, he knew how to sketch the map. Uh, because he was a physicist and a, an engineer, he was able to figure out the trigonomic points between different areas within a town. And bringing these different disciplines together was a, a great example of how, how he was a polymath and essentially did something in his time that was thought to be impossible. I think the, the last point that I'd have here, the, the second point that I, I see as being a key skill is iterative innovation, um, embracing lean and agile principles and being able to experiment, uh, then measure, then adapt, and then repeat. Um, so figure out you know, if there's a goal that you're heading towards, um, be quite clear what it is you're trying to achieve, but don't be stuck in your ways and how you achieve it. So be, be open and adaptive to changing. Uh, you have to create quite a, a well-governed sandbox, a, a place for experimentation that does have guardrails and rules in place that allows you to innovate and move straight from ideation through to implementation. Um, so if you get those right, I, I think that's the best way to do it. And, and maybe one last example, it's a show that I, I really like to watch called Silicon Valley. Um, and it, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, 
view on you know the tech industry based out of San Francisco. And what's quite remarkable is how the main company in the story, Pied Piper, pivoted over time and they were able to iteratively innovate. So they went from an image compression algorithm uh, through to seamless video chats, like a platform that we're speaking over today, yeah. uh, and ended the show after a couple of seasons by becoming this next generation decentralized internet, kind of like a Web3 uh, metaverse uh, participant. And just that evolution of how they moved and iterated was a great example of, uh, of some of those key skills. Yeah, and I think you know you really touch on some, some important skills there. I think you have to learn how to evaluate your prior assumptions um, and, and, and question whether or not they still hold, hold to be true. And I think you know, sometimes we, we assume that the assumptions that we had six months ago about you know the world, about the industry, about the sector, um, are and will continue to be true. But in reality, it's ever changing, right? And so the that agility and that ability to iterate, I think, is absolutely critical. And so if I had to juxtapose that, what skills should they be looking for, i.e., to bring on board to their business? So obviously, yeah. but you know, what skills should they be upskilling themselves in? But what about the skills which they should be looking for for themselves? So, so maybe from a more of a business lens, I think the one that's really important and perhaps underrated is, is something that I've always tried to embrace and uh, you know make one of my main tool sets in my arsenal, and that's really being a bridge between strategy and emerging technology. Mm-hmm. And if you're able to straddle that fine line between being a strategist and a technologist, it's quite powerful because you can help the business people to articulate their vision and understand what those uh, sort of strategic or financial goals are that you're working towards. But then you also have an understanding of the technology to understand, well, what's realistic? What's going to enable us to, uh, you know, shift the needle and move in that direction we're aiming for. And that's not to say you need to be an absolute expert in both fields, but you do need to have an understanding of both and serve as a translator between the business world and the technology world. So I think that's on the one hand, You know, maybe from a technology view, I think, of course, you know, skills in South Africa are quite rare in the emerging technology space. So if you can get your hands on really, really sharp data scientists, um, you know, individuals who who can develop in AI, blockchain and Web3, um, cloud developers, emerging fields like Internet of Things and, you know, as this whole metaverse takes off, maybe even AR and VR, uh, along with that sort of blockchain and Web3 angle. Uh, those are some of the technologies that I believe are are some of the strongest. And, and bearing in mind, you know, these are also growing fields, emerging fields. So as long as you're hiring for the right skill sets and someone who has the aptitude and the acumen to learn, so they've proven themselves to be a good developer in one field, if you can teach them and you can bring them along the journey to learn new languages and new skills, then I think you have yourself uh, some good talent. And then I think the last thing that I, that I should mention, there's always a soft skills component uh, that is sometimes looked, looked over. And it's, you know, it's things like um, hiring for empathy, for critical thinking, yeah. uh, for understanding, for you know, people who are able to motivate individuals and uplift them, get the best out of others. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's always been a big challenge in a few of the roles that I've played over the years to achieve results through other individuals. Yeah. Um, and sure, you know, I can I can train myself and try to be the best that I possibly can, but probably a bigger challenge is to drive a team and to bring that team to the best of their abilities. Yeah. So I think you know, merge a few of those together and try to look out for those skills and piecing it together. And I think whether you're a startup or a corporate, those are you know some of the skills that are critical and perhaps a different way of thinking about how you bring it together. Yeah, and I think it's an incredibly important point. Um, you know, uh, it's it, it is quite important to also focus on the intangibles as well, as well as those, those sort of tangible skills. And I think any entrepreneur listening to this is probably scribbling away with lots of notes. And thank you, Tim, for, for sharing that. And and finally, Tim, I guess a, a, a more personal question for you. How do you stay motivated um, to be a lifelong learner? Um, and, and what actually drives you to continue to learn as you do? Yeah. It's a, it's a difficult one, but it's such an important one. And uh, yeah, I try to make as much time as possible to do it. And there, there are five key disciplines that I often share. Um, I, um, about a year ago, I did a guest lecture at, um, 
MBX Business School to yeah. some of the MBA students. And it was all about being sort of a young leader and someone who's embracing change and agility and, and how you can try to be a lifelong learner. And some of the key points I shared was number one, be curious. So have a sponge like mind, yeah. uh, ask lots and lots of questions. No question is too silly to ask. Yeah. Um, always try to embrace the growth mindset uh, in that curiosity that you have. Uh, number two, you have to be deliberate. Uh, so you have to challenge yourself to learn new things. You have to carve out the time. That's sometimes one of the most difficult things. Mm. Uh, I like to embrace the five hour rule, which is uh, every week, for five hours, just try to spend time learning something new. So it's roughly one hour per working day that I, I spend, whether it be on a YouTube video or a podcast or an audio book, yeah. uh, reading articles, reading reports, just something to try and stimulate and, and learn something new. Um, number three, you have to have an open mind. Yeah. Um, so remain open to multiple perspectives. Uh, you have to avoid misinformation and confirmation bias. And I think in our current age, these are, you know, we often find ourselves down a rabbit hole, a bit of an echo chamber, being reinforced by things we already know or things that we like to hear. And it's good to challenge yourself and, you know, listen to someone uh, who you purposely know has a different view to you because there's always a perspective or something that you can gain from them. Okay. Uh, a book that really helped me to understand this point is called Think Again by, by Adam Grant and just really challenges the paradigm of, your thinking and, and how you think differently and have this open mind. Yeah. Um, I think the fourth one, um, you have to be productive. So when I do get myself into a stage of learning and, and trying to embrace something new, I try to find my flow state. And, you know, if I know I only have an hour, I don't want to be distracted during that time. So, you know, whether it be phone on airplane mode or, uh, you know, I, I like to listen to music. So I've got a got a Spotify playlist called Brain Music, which helps me to uh, focus in and just, you know, get what I need to do done. Uh, mm -hmm. That helps me to learn quite a lot. And then I think the, the last one, number five, uh, one that has become so important for, you know, not only myself, but many colleagues, many friends of mine, family members, um, it's to be mindful. And, you know, the, there are a lot of challenges around mental health and just mental well-being. And I think that, you know, if you're able to find an environment where you have goals, you, you're able to reflect on those goals, you're able to seek self-improvement, mm -hmm. uh, you reflect on, on work that you've done and uh, how you'd like to improve. And essentially, you set a purpose for yourself. What is it that you want to learn about? Uh, what are the key outcomes that you want to achieve? And, uh, you know, just be mindful and, and try to improve in everything that you do. I find you'll, you'll have more fun and you'll definitely learn a whole lot more. So I think those are probably my, my key five points. Be curious, be deliberate, be open-minded, be productive, and be mindful, and you'll be a lifelong learner. Yeah, no, and a very successful person at that as well. Um, and I think, Tim, I think you shared uh, a lot of wisdom with us, and I just want to thank you for coming on to the Impact Co. podcast um, and for sharing your insights. I think it's been extremely valuable for me to have listened to that, and I know for our listeners as well. And so I just want to thank you for coming on to the show and for being episode 37. We look forward to welcoming you back in the future as well. And I hope you've also enjoyed it as part of the journey as well. Yeah, to Fanzo, thank you so much. And uh, to, to you and your team at Impact Co, it's been a lovely conversation. I look forward to uh, watching many great episodes in the future and we'll certainly stay in touch. Thanks, Tim. Much appreciated. And to you, our listeners of the Impact Co podcast, thank you so much once again for listening in. Uh, thank you for sharing with your community, for subscribing. If you haven't yet done so, please do on either YouTube or any of the podcast platforms. And we want to thank you. And from Tim and myself, we want to say have a lovely day further. Thank you. Keep safe. Keep wearing your mask. Keep sanitizing. And we will see you soon. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.